Welcome to the Priceless Podcast. This podcast is made in partnership with the European Forum of LGBT Christian Groups. If you want to make a donation for this podcast and or the European Forum, you can click one of the links in the podcast description. And while you're at it, you can look at all the other links that are mentioned in this podcast. This is the second part of the interview with James Allison. So I hope you'll enjoy this part. And if you haven't seen the first one, go search for it or you can just watch it afterwards. But could you, before we start, tell a few words about yourself, introduce yourself and tell them who you are, what, whatever you would like to say about yourself. Gosh. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a priest and a theologian, a Catholic priest, a theologian, um, and uh, I live in Madrid in Spain, having lived in lots of different countries, Brazil, Chile, Bolivia, Mexico, United States, as well, of course, as my, my homeland, England. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been... Uh, how do we say that? I've been a, a, an out gay man as a, uh, as a priest for a long time, um, uh, with all sorts of adventures, uh, to, to tell, uh, regarding, regarding the ups and downs of that. Mm. In one part, when you talked about Pope Francis and his call, there was one question that came to my mind. I'm so confused by Pope Francis. In one way, it looks that he's so open towards LGBT people. And then in another situation, it looks like, you know, it goes like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> Um, yeah, it looks like one one step forward, one step back. Yes. Yeah, it's it's, uh, and I'm I personally am very confused with what he actually thinks, and he doesn't really say what he thinks. What can you say anything about it, or what you think is is happening? I mean, there can be so many reasons why he's doing this. Yeah, when he was. Uh, when he was first elected, um, an Argentine, an Argentinian friend uh, uh, of mine, who lived who lived in Buenos Aires all the time that he was Archbishop there, said, um, "Don't don't think of, of Francis as a progressive. He's he's a conservative, but he's the most progressive end of conservatism." <laughs> um, and I thought that was quite a useful. Uh, quite a useful way of describing him. Now, actually, I think that what we've seen of Francis Pope is much more than that. I think that he's understood something really fundamental, uh, which I think helps explain a bit this one step forward, two step back thing, which is that he is aware that movement is always sideways. That it's as people learn what is true through relationships with other people that we're able to advance in this sphere. In other words, that the pastoral eventually affects the doctrinal. Whereas there are lots of people who want him to make quick doctrinal changes that they think will then uh, make pastoral life easier. And of course, in one sense, they will. Um, but he thinks, I think, as far as I can tell, that that's a shortcut. And it's a shortcut that plays to people's sense that the church is really about control. Because it's, you know, whoever controls the mechanisms of uh, the rule book, that's the one who gets to decide who the church is. And that's not how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit works by opening up uh, signs of reconciled humanity uh, in real people's lives sideways and that it's therefore as people are able to move on that we are then able to challenge the definitions without that causing scandal to people and instantly becoming part of a ridiculous war and i think that that explains how at the same time he's 
always fighting against those who want uh, quick decisions and to change the rule book or to use the rule book, whether they're on the right or on the, the left. And what he's always trying to keep open is the possibility of people uh, changing and allowing change to be produced, which is why, uh, you know, that's the key thing he wants to do. He doesn't want acts of power from above. <laughs> he wants to keep open the acts of power from alongside, uh, if you like. The, that's the so that's that's how I understand it. That may be a misunderstanding, but that's that's how I understand the difference. Why why it is, for instance, that he's so free when it comes to pastoral initiatives, and so clunky when it comes to uh, changing any definitions. Um, we'll see. I think I think that, like you know, like many sensible people, he wants to be put into a position where he has to make uh, the changes because everybody is saying, of course, this doesn't this doesn't work like this. But what he doesn't want to do is to put in the position whereby he's being used as part of a of a war uh, between people who are threatening schism about this and that and the other. But you know he's a he's a canny old Jesuit superior, uh, so he knows how to deal with uh, uh, with this, and he knows, for instance, how many of the people uh, in the Vatican who are his enemies are frightened closet uh, people who want strict world because it's what keeps them together. It helps keep their world together. So, uh, yeah, I think that, that, that that's how I make sense of that. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's accurate or not because like you, I, I get different messages from the different uh, uh, things he said. But I think it's always better to assume that there is a good, uh, what's the word? That there is a good integrity that rather than simply schizophrenic uh, positions. And that's the way I try to explain uh, the good integrity which I see underlying. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can always see that there could be a reason behind it, a good reason. You know, I might not agree with the reason, but... At the same time, I also know, you know, on one side, we as people or people who belong to the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, in in some things, they want the Pope to make the decisions, the good Absolutely. decisions. They think that they are good. In right. the, in the, uh, and then in another time, they don't want him to make the decisions. And then they're angry because he uses his power to, to do things. So... Yeah, I, I I can hear what you are saying, and it 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 does make sense. Of course, we don't know what he's thinking, <laughs> and we can't assume. But what he seems to be very good at is these little nudges, these little signs, that in fact really push people along because it gets everybody talking. And once everybody gets talking, it's interesting. You can detect how things are really changing. Uh, and in a sense, it's those little things, I think, uh, that make possible either the, the time when the decision, when the, you know, when the, the, the definitions are able to be changed or make it unnecessary to change the definitions because everybody has in fact already moved on and everybody agrees that that is simply a document from the past that nobody pays any attention to. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, yeah, uh, it's, it's a mixture of encouraging and infuriating <laughs> for, 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 for all of us, I guess. Yeah. In a situation like this, you mentioned this war, and often I also see that LGBT activists or organizations are kind of going into a war with the church, and of course vice versa you know it's it goes back and forth so for the lgbt activists uh who are either from the church or are not directly from the church what do you think is the best way to make a dialogue happen with the hierarchy i'm not sure i mean i think that i think that the first thing is never to allow the obstacle to become a rival 
with the object. I'll explain what I mean by that. If you, you or I are an LGBT activist, whether from a simply a social group or whether from a faith group, what is the object? The object is creating space whereby our sisters and brothers can live freely with legal rights uh, and uh, a quality of life as themselves, such that they're able to act, take part in the life of the country, the church, etc. Um, and that's true whether we're in Uganda or whether we're in Croatia. Obviously, with, with all the differences uh, and the difficulties. Now, because so many people have a history, uh, and usually a bad history, with relation to the church, it's very easy for them to be locked into a certain obsession with the hierarchy. And of course, it's very easy for the hierarchy to be locked into an obsession with them. Uh, because for the hierarchy, it becomes a very convenient scapegoat. I mean, you only need to listen to the Polish bishops, um, and you have clearly a very frightened bunch of, in some cases, closeted and dishonest people waging a completely fictitious war against whatever they call it, rainbow peril or plague or whatever it is that they dream up, um, as part of their desperate attempt to hold on to relevance and influence as they sense uh, a huge shift in society which is not going to allow them to occupy the place of importance that they have occupied for the last 50 years. So, um, there is this, if you like, useful obsession which people have with each other being each other's bad guys. Um, but that gets in the way of the object, <laughs> which is... Um, creating good, safe space for our sisters and brothers. So for me, the first question is how not to be obsessed by the hierarchy. They are not very important, certainly not as important as they think they are. And the really important things that you can do are to be done at the ordinary, social, human, civic level with your family, with your friends, with your village, with your city. Uh, that's the way uh, we really do things. Now, <clears throat> sometimes it becomes possible to talk to the hierarchy. But it should only, I think, should only ever be an accidental thing. A hierarchy are generally too frightened to talk honestly about this. Sometimes when you get really good groups, for instance, and I think this is often the way of the parents' groups. Uh, it's been the groups of parents of LGBT believers in different countries. It's when you get the parents' groups, that they are able to go and dialogue uh, with the hierarchy. Because whereas the hierarchy is often very frightened to talk to gay and lesbian people, mainly because they're aware that many of the gay and lesbian people are like themselves, and if you like, it's, it's too frightening. Whereas it's much, much easier for them to talk to the parents of gay and lesbian people because, of course, they know that it's not the faults of parents and gay and lesbian people and they have no moral condemnation of the parents. And that's when you're able to start getting, you know, discussions about things like, for instance, having a vigil against homophobia in a parish. Uh, and little by little, little signs uh, like that start to emerge through parents' groups. Um, but it's really only when you're not obsessed with the need to get the hierarchy on side. My sense with uh, the hierarchy is that these are people who are, if you like, they are franchise managers. They're frightened to step outside what the limits of their franchise can do. They think they're, they're legally constrained uh, by, by canon law. Uh, they may be personally frightened by this matter or they may not. But they're certainly institutionally, uh, they feel institutionally constrained by it. So the question is, create opportunities in which they can, if they want, uh, step, uh, step into a more peaceful relationship. And I think that lots of groups have done that in, in Italy, in Spain, in different cities, all over the place, um, without grand 
without anything very grand, but little by little spaces of friendliness in which things are able to be talked about, uh, are able to be created. But I think that for that to happen, it's really necessary that we don't be resentful. And above all, that we don't allow ourselves to play games of resentment. You know, uh, church authority is very good at playing culture war games, and activists of any sort are very good at playing culture war games. But then you end up with a world which suits both parties, in which each is, is each other's necessary bad guy, uh, which makes each one feel, feel better about themselves, but actually doesn't allow anything really to change. Um, so I think that above all, uh, the temp- it's important to avoid that temptation, to avoid being the good guy with the necessary bad guy, it's to stop being obsessed by one's enemy, and to start saying, okay, forget my enemy. What is the good I can actually get on with creating? And don't allow the bastards to occupy too much free rental space in my head. <laughs> it's when the bastards occupy free rental space in my head that does me a lot of harm, and it does them no harm at all. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean that you have to think that they're nice or that they're good. It just says, you people are dangerous because you don't understand who you are, you don't understand the power and influence you have, but I'm not going to allow that to get in the way of the good that I'm going to do. Later we may talk. <laughs> so I think that I think that it's uh, you know, in a certain sense we have to be the adults in the room. You can't rely you can't rely on the hierarchy to be adults in this sphere. Mm. I I have to ask this question because uh, you you mentioned several times that there are many priests who are closeted gays. Do you maybe know? Someone asked me when I when I told uh, actually my partner when I when I talked to him about that, he said like, but where does this information come from? If they're closeted, how do you know that there are so many? gay people this was one thing that he was wondering which i thought was a good point and the second thing is where he said when one thing i don't really like about about this um way of thinking is it sounds like again someone is blaming the gay people for making the problems within the catholic church so how would you react yeah. to that? Um, I mean, first of all, the the statistical question. Of course, there are no accurate statistics, um, but uh, anyone who thinks that gay priests are a minority uh, in the church are likely to be um, is likely to be disabused if they spend much time. Uh, meeting with uh, priests over time. Remember, of course, that there is the closet uh, in the strictest sense of nobody knows, and then there is the ecclesiastical closet, which is everybody knows and nobody knows, uh, um, so long as we don't talk about it. It's a huge don't ask, don't tell. Uh, because of course you've all been in seminary together, so you've all you know you know enough about each other. Uh, you know enough to be surprised if somebody gets to get if somebody leaves the priesthood to get married to somebody of the opposite sex uh, you would not be surprised <laughs> if somebody leaves to get to be with someone of the same sex you would not be surprised uh, in other words you know after all if you live together with people however much however closeted they are there are always little games that there are always little giveaways etc etc um so then, you know, people who've tried to study uh, these matters, uh, like Richard Sipes or the Martel book, uh, which I recommended to you, Frederick Martel's book, Sodoma, Power and Hypocrisy in the Vatican, uh, gives a much more accurate picture. And we're talking like in the Vatican, we're talking about 80% or more. Uh, and that's the estimates of those people who are there. Um, uh, in the high, uh, upper clergy in general. In big metropolitan dioceses, you're talking about something in that sort. In rural dioceses, typically in some countries in South America, which I've lived in, in rural dioceses, the clergy are, 
are largely uh, all have mistresses. I mean, it's all. Uh, there's no assumption. There's no real presumption that they are going to be celibate. They are going to be formally unmarried, but uh, they will have a concubine in there. And that has been so since the Spanish conquest, and no one is surprised by it at all. Uh, that's just how things are in certain parts of Peru and Bolivia, particularly in the rural in the rural dioceses. Um, so there are some parts of the world where there are a significant proportion of gay, of, of heterosexual clergy, but in most Western um, metropolitan areas, you're going to have a, a large, uh, a largely gay, uh, a largely gay clergy. And this is no surprise to anybody, really. Um, as to how this has happened and blaming people, I mean, curiously, I think, uh, uh, yeah, clearly it's not a, uh, blaming people is not a, a good thing to do. And I don't think it is a question of blaming people. Um, I think of it this way. From, let us say, the late 19th century um, until the 1960s or 70s, uh, Let's imagine that uh, in Western society, uh, really the only safe place to be uh, to be gay for most of that time was within the clergy. Uh, it was the one place where, if you were delicate, artistic. Uh, and not sporting and not uh, showing an obvious sign of wanting to get married and have a girlfriend. It was the one place where nobody would ask you when you were going to get married and <laughs> where was your girlfriend. Uh, so, and it was at the time, remember, in civil society, uh, it was a very dangerous uh, civil society was very dangerous for, uh, for gay people blackmail, suicide, disease, uh, murder. These were regular parts of uh, of life uh, uh, in all Western societies uh, in, uh, um, you know, until comparatively recently. There were exceptional periods of relative freedom, such as in the Weimar Republic in Germany. Um, but this was not life for most people most of the time. So. For a long time, the safest place for gay people was the clergy. Um, now, from the 1950s onwards, that started to change as Western civil societies started to become more uh, tolerant and the laws started to change all over the Western world. From, it was in the 1960s that the law changed in the United Kingdom. It was in different different years in other in other different uh, countries. But little by little, crim criminalization was dropped. Visibility started to increase, uh, and so what you had within the church was that which had been the safest place to be gay, you know, which had which had been, if you like, a, a relatively bland form of hypocrisy. A don't ask, don't tell. In the midst of a violent world, as civil society became a more peaceful place, the don't ask, don't tell world in the church suddenly started to become much crueler because <laughs> it was beginning to enforce what had previously been unenforced, don't ask, don't tell, because it was the safe space. But then suddenly, as things became easier outside and visibility became possible, uh, you started having this much more enforced don't ask, don't tell. Uh, in other words, it became something like a form of emotional blackmail, which it hadn't been before. It had been the safest uh, uh, and freest space before. And I think that that is what happened. I think that since the 1970s, the 1970s, basically church uh, authority went into panic about uh, uh, the presence within itself of so much and tighten down on the don't ask, don't tell, which meant trying to make definitions and trying to weed people out and so on and so forth. Um, so it's not so much that it's the fault uh, of gay people. It's that the church is, uh, uh, you know, a part of, of the societies in which, in which it lives. And the 
it is a, an ordinary part of the struggle that all of our societies have to go with regards pockets of dishonesty and pockets of honesty, um, such that we can gradually become places where we can all uh, be honest. So, yes, I think that it's, um, you know, there's a tremendous uh, helplessness as well within the structure when people realize how trapped they are, how long they long to be free and long to be honest and yet are aware that if they were honest, they wouldn't be able to do any of the good things that they are able to do. Um, and uh, if they, but if they remain dishonest, they're destroying themselves. This is an awful, it's an awful place uh, to be. And actually, there was some very good interview done by the BBC with a relation to priests in Brazil, which brought out how how much agony and pain this uh, uh, this causes. Which is why I think that, that um, you know this is such a sensitive area. I think everyone knows that the real issue is the closet. Uh, the real issue, uh, that's what has to be dealt with when the clerical closet is no longer an obligatory form of life. Then both for lay people and for clergy, the world is going to be a whole lot easier uh, to cope with. And managing the collapsing closet is part of what any responsible church or figure is having to do. Uh, that's where we are. So, I guess I don't see it so much as as fault as uh, just the difficult navigation of a very big societal change in the last hundred years. <laughs> Do you think a time will come <laughs> when the Roman Catholic Church will become, first of all, more affirming of LGBT Christians? and then also willing to bless same-sex couples, and then maybe even, is it possible that one day the Roman Catholic Church would be able to, to make it possible to have the sacrament of marriage for same-sex couples? Yeah, well, with relation to the first, the first question, remember that in many parts of the world, Uh, not not anything like enough. The ordinary experience of many uh, gay and lesbian Catholics is actually that their church is quite affirming. Uh, you know, at a local level, in parishes, gay couples are known, liked, are part of ordinary life, etc., etc., get on with things. There's no particular fuss in lots of places. Um, not everywhere, and it certainly should be much, much more. <laughs> um, but little by little, the fact is that on the ground lay Catholics are much more gay-friendly than the official discourse would uh, would pretend. And we all know this. In fact, it's one of the great hidden secrets is how much more gay-friendly on the ground the Catholic Church is than its authorities say it is. So I hope that that will continue and grow, and I think it is. I think that the the positive response just about everywhere to the question of the blessings is a sign that on the ground, people just get on with it. So, um, the question is, will the definitions change eventually? And the answer is yes, of course. The definitions are clearly false. Uh, and the question is, when will people have the courage to say, actually, we need to move on from this, and we need to talk in an adult way about this, and we need to stop being frightened and emotionally blackmailed into thinking that we're somehow going against God by, uh, by challenging this false way of talking. So, Uh, that's beginning to happen. And I think that, in part from, apart from anything else, sensible church authorities are aware that they have a massive evangelization problem on their hands. They cannot evangelize with youth while they are so ludicrous in their discourse about gay people because young people just don't accept their nonsense talk about gay and lesbian people. They know too many gay and lesbian people from school, from their youth, from university, etc. Et so, as, as church officials become aware that evangelization has more importance for the future of the church than holding on to bad definitions that make them all look stupid and entrap lots of people in cruel lives, 
then this starts to open up. And I think that we're already seeing signs that people are aware that that's uh, got to happen. And it's the same with, uh, with the blessings. The more people know people, the more it's obvious uh, that you want to take part in the, the blessing of your friends as you do in the marriage of your friends. And then, uh, over time, the question of uh, marriage. Um, at the moment, you know, people are trying to say, oh, well, maybe blessings, but certainly not marriage. And my response to that is always, eh, never say never. Uh, remember that the uh, marriage only became a sacrament in pretty late on. I think it was the 13th century. Um, it took an awfully long time for marriage to be recognized as a, as, as a sacrament and for the understanding of how it works uh, to be a, a sacrament. Um so I think that it's not going to be obvious for some time whether it is or it isn't. For me, I think that the first question for all of us is to have what I call enough jurisprudence. And that means enough experience in our midst of openly living and loving stable couples who are part of our church life, who are giving witness both by their being together and by the way that they interact with uh, the life of the church, the life of charity, the life of help, the life of building each other up. I think that that will, you know, it's only when we see that that it will become clear what we're talking about. Um, I, and, I, and I think that it's only when you've got the lived witness that the juridical questions become uh, important. And I would say another thing, which is that it's, you know, it's within the last generation in most of our countries that same-sex marriage or some civil equivalent has become possible. Which means that it's only the next generation, the kids who were born probably after the year 2000, um, and perhaps the kids who were born after 2010, uh, who are going to have grown up by the time they reach 20, there will never have been a time in their lives when they couldn't imagine the possibility of being married to someone of the same sex. I think that's an enormously important uh, point, that it's only going to be a generation of people who could take for granted the normalness of their pattern of love, courtship, and marriage. It's only when they are married that we are all going to be able to learn <laughs> whether it's the same as uh, heterosexual marriage or not. For the moment, you know, for our generation, this has been part of a campaign for obvious reasons. Um, this has been part of a struggle. Most of us were born at a time when this was impossible. Most of us, during our adolescences, could not imagine a time when we could be legally and even religiously married to someone of the same sex. That has effects on our emotional life, on our spiritual life, on our imagination. So what I think is really important is uh, that we, as gay and lesbian Christians accompany the generation of the kids who are growing up to see what this is going to look like, what this is going to mean for them, how it's going to work, what kind of witness will they give, how are we going to receive that witness. So for me, that's the, uh, the question. And then I think it'll become obvious whether or not it is to be a sacrament in the same sense or whether we need to come up with another uh, term. In other words, the question of that there will be a degree of sacramentality is not in doubt. The question is, what sort? <laughs> and I think that that's, you know, for me that's an open question. Uh, but it's an open question that is not to be sorted out cerebrally. It's to be sorted out experimentally <laughs> uh, by witness. Uh, uh, for me, that's the... That's, that's what I would... Uh, what I would say. Mm. Yeah, thank you for this answer. Uh, one thing that frustrated f 
frustrates me all the time is that I have a certain expectation of the church, but I guess it's also because the church is just giving themselves the right to be the so-called moral police. And then I would really, I'm expecting of the church <laughs> to show morality or humanity even before society. But when I look at history, it's always the church or, of course, there were always individuals within the church who were very, uh, who were fighting for human rights, who were protecting people. But it seems that the church is always behind, you know, when it comes to protecting women, Jews, black people. The church is always late and it's frustrating me. <laughs> It makes me yes, actually right. yeah. angry because they're talking about this message of taking care of people and love. and yeah. But yeah. practically, it's, you know, the people who are outside the church are doing a much better job. <laughs> so what do we do Sometime. with that? Sometimes, Sometimes, of course. Sometimes. Yeah, no, I think, I, I, I don't think we ought to... Uh, um, What's the word to uh, either uh, canonize or or completely rubbish the church? The church does often do quietly a lot of good things um, uh, for which it doesn't get credit, and does a lot of bad things for which it gets very quick uh, condemnation. Um, so I think that we always have to imagine that in any of our societies, the religious leadership is going to be a strange mixture of the progressive and the cowardly. Um, uh, with a discourse that says one thing and a practice that does the other, you know, we humans are hypocrites. Um, and uh, the whole question is not to be obsessed by it, I think. That's the, the key thing. Is, uh, don't ask what your community can do for you. Ask what you can do for your community. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's the difficult thing. How do we imagine a way forward without worrying too much about whether what you call the church, meaning essentially the institutional structure uh, that will be ready for it when it comes along. And, and often that's, that's the most you can do. And sometimes you surprise yourself by finding people who give it a sudden push in a friendly direction, as your archbishop recently did suddenly in Croatia, to everyone's surprise. <laughs> And and more often than not, that you're uh, uh, shocked when they say things of such such overwhelming stupidity and backwardness that you wonder what on earth have I got to do with this organization? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess I guess it's at the end there is not a huge difference. But people are people, and uh, the hierarchy. You know, it, as soon as it gets. Uh, when the church where it's institutionalized the institution part is a political organization and it acts in a political way it's thinking it's weighing things and how are the people going to take yeah. it so yeah it's church happens at the grassroots level and uh, that's what you said where the biggest change will happen and how the change will happen not Oh, and it's already happening. Yeah, yes, exactly. And it's, already, exactly. it's already happening. Yes. Um, yeah, and remember that everything is a political thing. The grassroots things are political as well, but just in different ways. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, they think of the history of uh, Germany between 1934 and 1945. Um, think of the extreme political behavior of many hierarchs, the great bravery of some very few hierarchs, but the significantly higher bravery of very many lay Catholics. Uh, that was, again, one of the things that people people forget is that you know, the, the hierarchy may have had a, a cowardly history with relation to, to the Nazi regime, but actually many of the people who did the most to hide and to protect Jewish people were Catholics. Uh, in other words, they knew where the kingdom was to be found, even as their hierarchs did not. 
And that's, uh, that's what we have to do, to learn to detect the signs of the kingdom in the midst of whatever awful situation we're in, and go for it. What would you tell LGBT Catholics who are within their churches, and church is something important to them, but they just can't find the support from the church that they need or are even longing for? Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, that's uh, very difficult depending on where they are, um, what kind of country, what civil laws it has, uh, uh, and therefore how easy or difficult it is for them to meet up with anybody uh, uh, who is like them, whether in a religious or not religious uh, setting. But I would, you know, I would say the first thing is, <clears throat> one of the things that we do have is the internet and the, uh, the ability to start uh, linking up with other people uh, virtually, which has been being done a lot during COVID, uh, even in places where normally people can meet together. So I would hope that the fact that such people are able, for instance, to listen to your podcast uh, would mean that they have some access to find voices uh, that can speak uh, to them. And so they begin to become aware that they aren't actually alone. I think that's the first thing. And that there are other people and then begin to discover where geographically uh, are they able to find uh, people uh, like themselves? Because I, I think that in, you know, even in, in even in very tough places, I think of a group that I visited in Poland where things have been extremely tough and parts of the country have been declared, what is it, LGBT-free zones and things like that, that even from people in those parts of the country are able, are aware that there are groups, that there are people like them, that they can meet, even if not as frequently uh, as they would like. Um, but but that's it, yes. It's uh, it's Christianity of the catacombs. Uh, it's uh, learning how to discover others who are able to share one's life um, in the modern equivalent of catacombs, which is the strange sorts of visibility and invisibility which are imposed on us, as you say, by uh, by what is a frightened and dishonest form of church life. Um, that is only slowly beginning to become aware of how frightened and dishonest it is and how it needn't be. So, uh, so yes, my first suggestion is, you know, find, if it's at all possible, find other people close enough to yourself of whatever, of whatever religious or cultural background with whom you are able to become safe and healthy as a person. And then start praying for ways, praying all along, but praying for ways of being able to join up with other people like yourself with whom you're able to share faith. But whatever is possible to become a safe, healthy, uh, gay person, lesbian person in the process of being able to enter into your humanity that's the first. That's the first thing. Uh, don't put that on hold until you're able to find <laughs> uh, the right religious group. As you discover your human, remember that the church is for the world. As you discover your humanity, so you will be able to create church that will genuinely be a sign of God's reconciling work with humanity. What keeps you going? Where do you take, where do you get your strength from, your motivation to, to go on in a surrounding mm. which is very often so conservative and where you, yeah, experience all sorts of hardship when you talk about LGBT, the LGBT topic? Um, well, First of all, uh, I don't, it's not that the. Uh, I think the key thing here is not the question that the ambiance is conservative. Um, it's that it's dishonest and frightened. I think these are two quite different things. Um, 
uh, I've learnt to distinguish between uh, that which is conservative and that which is dishonest and frightened. I consider myself quite a conservative Catholic theologian. I have given you a conservative Catholic reason for why the current teaching of <laughs> for why the current teaching is clearly wrong. But it's because I'm really quite a conservative Catholic theologian that I I think those things, uh, because I've essentially given you a a defense of a, a richer understanding of natural law than the one which uh, <laughs> uh, church authority holds. And I'm also aware of many people who are liberal on the surface, but run away a thousand miles when any question of reputation comes. And there are some people who are conservative on the surface and are able, in fact, to be much more uh, merciful and kind in this area. So that's that's how I, I I see things. I don't think I don't think curiously that the fight here is between is a conservative uh, one. I think it's one to do with uh, honesty and fear. Those are the those are the key uh, the key things. Um, secondly, I suffer very little um, because. Uh, in one sense, you know, I've paid the price. There's really nothing that anybody can do <laughs> about me uh, anymore. There are many other people who suffer terribly through fear of job loss uh, in some countries, uh, particularly in Africa and some Islamic countries, uh, at risk of life, uh, you know, and so on. There's, there are terrifying realities in different countries uh, of the world. Um, but often, as many of us, I feel faint-hearted and find it difficult uh, to go on. But if there's something which if there's something which energizes me, it's this: it's the realization uh, that uh, if there is to be an understanding of and a living of the Christian faith going forward, it will be not in spite of gay and lesbian people, but it will be because gay and lesbian people have worked through all the shit of bad Christianity and worked out what is really true for themselves and will be able to stand up with consciences formed in the first person and say, I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. Yes, I get things wrong. Yes, I screw up. Yes, I have a lot to learn. But no, I'm not frightened of these wolves <clears throat> trying to create fake Christianity by using people like me as an enemy, merely because they need security or to create a decorative Christian fantasy world. No, I know that's not true. And I am going to be a bearer of the gospel and understanding that Jesus died for me, for us, so as to take us into the new creation. So for me, it's, it's tremendously important not only to be fighting, if you like, for the civil rights of people, which is absolutely vital, but also for the understanding that this is basic Christianity. You know, it's, uh, if there is going to be Christians in the next century, it's people because we will have worked through this stuff. The stone that was rejected by the builders has become the head of the corner. This is a wonderful thing and it was done by the Lord. That is Jesus' response to the parable of the vineyard. <clears throat> and I think that that's the dynamic. It's the former thrown out ones who, if we're able to live without resentment and discover the richness of faith, are able to create the, uh, uh, the field, the, the vineyard, uh, and help produce its fruit with others. So for me, that's, if you like, I'm, I often fail at doing this, but that for me is what, uh, uh, is what I think I should be doing, even if I often fail very badly at, uh, uh, at doing it. Thank you for tuning in and being with us for the second part of this interview. You can watch the first part of this interview if you haven't seen it yet. This podcast was made in partnership with the European Forum of LGBT Christian Groups. If you want to listen to the audio version, you can do so by searching for the Priceless Podcast within your favorite podcast app. 
you can give a donation to this podcast to help me continue with this podcast or you can give a donation to the European Forum by clicking one of the links in the podcast description or you can even click both of them. Well, this was it from us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed being with us. See you in a week. So until then, bye everyone.